Our selection of footage devoted to the X1A begins with a short segment of edited film depicting the launch and landing of the aircraft, probably created for briefing purposes sometime in the early 1950s. There was no audio included with this footage, and we're presenting it exactly as it was received from the National Archives. After that edited sequence, we'll transition into a mythical composite mission put together from films shot during an assortment of X-1A flight operations. Before we dive in too deeply into the X-1A, let's quickly discuss why there's no footage of the X-1D or the X-1C. In the case of the X-1D, we can chalk that up to an unusually short life that consisted of just one single flight. The first X-1 variant was, very counterintuitively, the D version. Like all of the X-1 series, the D model was built by Bell Aircraft at their plant in Buffalo, New York, after a contract for the first four X-1 follow-on projects was signed between Bell and the Air Force on April 2nd, 1948. Note that this date is about six months after Jaeger's first supersonic flight in October 1947, but before the Air Force officially provided public confirmation of that flight in June of 1948. The contract called for Bell to provide the Air Force with aircraft that would reach airspeeds in excess of Mach 2 and altitudes over 90,000 feet. Also, aerodynamic heating would be studied, as would rudimentary reaction control systems. The A and B models would focus on dynamic stability, flight loads, and general flying qualities, while the D model would be focused on aerodynamic heating. The C model, intriguingly, would study armament systems and how aircraft like the X-1 might be used in a combat role. This last possibility was especially appealing to Bell. Research contracts in that post-World War II environment were nice for an aircraft company to snag, but the real payoff would be for a research project to make the leap to a serially produced aircraft. Unfortunately for Bell, the X-1C was canceled before the ink was even dry on the contract. Now let's talk about the D model. The D model had essentially the same wing as the original first generation X-1, but the fuselage was lengthened by over five feet. This allowed for the installation of larger propellant tanks, which translated into longer burn times, higher altitudes, and greater speeds. The nitrogen-fed fuel pressure system on the earlier model was replaced by a turbo pump system, although nitrogen gas would still be used for a variety of onboard systems. After a cross-country delivery flight underneath a B-50 assigned to the program, the X-1D was ready for its first flight at Murak on July 24, 1948. Gene Ziegler, a Bell Company pilot, was at the controls for what was supposed to be a simple glide flight. Unfortunately, the nose gear collapsed on landing and the aircraft slid on the lake bed for over a thousand feet. Repairs, fortunately, were fairly simple and they took about a month. The next flight attempt of the X-1D was scheduled for August 22nd and was to be flown by Air Force pilot Pete Everest. After he squirmed his way into the X-1D cockpit, he saw an unacceptable nitrogen source pressure reading and called for a mission abort. The fuel was jettisoned from the X-1D and a short time later, an explosion was heard. Ever scrambled back up into the mothership, after which the aircraft was dropped to fall to the desert below. An investigation was conducted, and the fault was found to be an Ulmer leather gasket in the X-1D fuel system. This was not the last time that a leather gasket would lead to the destruction of a Bell X-Series aircraft. One of the first-generation X-1 aircraft was lost to a very similar explosion and fire, as was an X-1A. A next-generation X-2 research aircraft would also be lost to a very similar gasket failure. The gaskets were made by treating leather with carnauba wax and tricresyl phosphate. However, when they get exposed to liquid oxygen, even a light impact had the potential to cause an explosion. 
It wasn't until after the 1955 X-1A explosion that the Air Force called for the Ulmer leather gaskets to be removed from all aircraft after four X-planes had already been lost. So that provides some background for our footage of the X-1A. The X-1A arrived at Murak, which they now called Edwards Air Force Base, from the Bell Plant in New York on January 7, 1953. Bell pilot Gene Ziegler flew the first several flights, starting with a glide test on February 14th. A week after that, on February 21st, he made the first powered flight in the X-1A. The Bell test flights continued until April, at which point the aircraft was returned back to the factory in New York for modifications in the wake of the loss of the X-1D. With modifications complete, the X-1A was delivered back to California for the start of the formal research program. Jaeger took the aircraft to Mach 1.15 during a flight on November 21st, and pushed it to Mach 1.9 in 60,000 feet a couple of weeks later. On December 12th, Jaeger was back in the X-1A for yet another flight, which climbed to 70,000 feet and Mach 2. Jaeger leveled out and continued to accelerate. As he approached Mach 2.4, he noticed that the aircraft was beginning an uncommanded roll to the left. He tried to correct, as he'd been trained, with right rudder and aileron when the X-1A suddenly went out of control. Jaeger was knocked out as he was tossed about in the cockpit during a very rapid descent. At about 30,000 feet, he finally snapped back to consciousness and found himself very inconveniently in an inverted flat spin. He was able to recover from the spin and immediately pointed the aircraft back to the lake bed at Edwards, for a safe landing. Jaeger had fallen victim to a phenomenon called roll coupling or inertia coupling, which can be described as a gyroscopic effect where an aircraft turns away from the direction of flight. Intriguingly, aerodynamicists had predicted that inertia coupling would potentially be a problem as airspeeds increased and that the problem could be corrected by increasing the size of the vertical stabilizer. The Air Force issued a decree that the X-1A not be flown at speeds faster than Mach 2 as a result of this flight. Interestingly enough, this roll coupling episode was famously dramatized in the movie The Right Stuff. The X-1A continued to fly with an emphasis on high altitude research, and Major Arthur Murray set an altitude record of 90,440 feet on August 26, 1954. His record stood until Ivan Kinchelow took the Bell X-2 to 126,000 feet a couple of years later. On August 8th, Joe Walker was scheduled to fly the X-1A, but yet another problem with an Ulmer leather gasket led to yet another fire, and the burning aircraft was jettisoned onto the desert in order to save the mothership. A few things to look for as this footage spools out. First, the Air Force seems to have gone all in on color film production by the early to mid 50s, and for that, I thank them greatly. Second, notice that the loading procedures for the X-1A are a bit more refined and formal than they were for the first generation X-1 aircraft. There's more safety gear and protective clothing in evidence, and everything seems a bit less ad hoc. Third, the landing pit used for the early X-1 has been replaced by a three-point hydraulic jack system, which is capable of lifting the B-29 mothership high over the parasite aircraft being loaded. One final detail I noticed was the different appearance of the natural metal finish of the liquid oxygen tank ahead of the wing and aft of the cockpit. 